John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Last words are vital words. Perhaps you can recall the last words of a loved one, family member, a friend. And those words ring in your ears, not only for days and weeks, but oftentimes decades. I remember the last words of my mother to me. They're very precious. Not everyone has that history whereby they can recall their, the last words of a loved one with affection. I have that privilege, but last words are certainly vital words. And when you know it's going to be your last words, you put particular emphasis on the most important things to say. As a pastor, I've been around folk that are near death and know it, and they talk about important things. They don't speak of trivial things. They don't say, you know, all my life I wanted our front door to be green, and when never got my wish... They talk about big things. They tell me, when you see my dad, when you see my mom, when you see my son, would you tell them this? Important things. And Jesus is saying some important things, knowing he's about to die. He's going to be raised again from the dead, but this is really important material. It's the final night with his disciples before his arrest. The betrayal by Jesus by Judas is already in process, and within 24 hours, he's going to be dying the very next day. And here Jesus uses a word picture. He's illustrating something vital, something vitally important, the nature of genuine salvation, what true salvation looks like. Now, there's many things Jesus could have done here uh, to make his point. But he chose this analogy at this time to communicate the truth. He, he could have done a, a number of things. One option would be to do uh, what some would do if they take on the evangelical idea of what salvation is, which Jesus didn't hold to, but it's out there and it's prevalent. Is He could have said, okay, guys, uh, check the back of your Tanakhs. The, the Old Testament, as we call it, the Hebrew Bible, uh, get, get your Tanakhs out, and, and um, what I want you to do is um, show me the day and date that you raised your hand in one of my services, that you walked the aisle, that you said a prayer, that you signed a card. Show me that. Uh, Thomas, yeah, you, bring it up here. Thomas, I want to see where it says, I, Thomas, confess Jesus as the Messiah, and as my personal Lord and Savior. Day, month, year. I want to see that, because that will show me and you, after I'm gone, that you're in the kingdom. 
You know he didn't do that. He could have done that, but that's not what he did. Mainly because that's a totally unbiblical way to view salvation. We're not saved because we say a prayer, although saved people will pray. But it's not the saying of something that gets us in the kingdom. It's not the profession of our faith alone that saves. It's the possession of faith. It's actually having true faith. That is a faith that will be professed. We must confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord. Romans 10 verse 9. But we're not saved by saying a bunch of things. Didn't Jesus say, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. But he will say, I never knew you. Instead here, he speaks about fruit. Fruit that is authentic. Fruit that is genuine. Fruit that cannot be self-manufactured. It has to be born from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, a true disciple is known by his fruit. Fruit demonstrates true discipleship, true conversion. It's far more than mere profession because we're not saved, one one more time, by a profession of faith, but by the possession of it. It's a faith that will be professed, to be sure, but true conversion is takes place in the heart and flows out of the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if there is no heart alive to God, nothing we say will bring that to pass. The 1689 London Baptist Confession in modern English in chapter 11, article 2, reads like this. Faith that, je- that receives and rests on Christ and His righteousness is the only instrument of justification yet it does not occur by itself in the person justified, but it is always accompanied by every other saving grace. It is not a dead faith, but works through love. I believe that is a summary of Scripture teaching. You see, if someone were to come to you and say, I've just been involved in a really horrific car crash, and you take a look at their car and don't see a scratch on it, There's reason to doubt the testimony. If there's a car crash, there'll be evidence to show it. There'll be dents. There'll be crumpled up metal somewhere. There'll be signs that the impact has occurred. But if that car looks like it's just been bought new from a car dealership, doesn't that cause you to question the testimony? I've just been involved in a horrific car crash. Well, which car was it? The one outside? You go look at it and it's spanking new, and you think, hmm, I'm not calling you a liar. It's not for me to judge, but um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Now, fruit is not the basis of our salvation. Works, the things we do, are in no way the basis of our salvation. But a saved man, a saved woman, a saved boy and girl will produce works but they're never the basis of their standing before God. Works are the fruit, not the root of our salvation. A clear scripture on that is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and then 10. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has ordained that we walk in them. We're not saved by our works, we're saved for good works. And there's a big, big difference. But the faith that justifies is not a dead faith, and that's the point of James chapter 2, as you remember. You may say you have faith, you may profess you have faith, but if you've got the real thing, show me. Show me. Show me. True faith that justifies is not dead. It will produce fruit, and get this, immediately. There'll be a change. If there's a car crash, it's not 20 years later that you see the dents. There'll be an immediate impact and an impact that can be seen. Something will have changed. Your relationship with God, one of estrangement has come Full circle, and you're now reconciled to God with a heart to know God, and something is different now in your life. 
You and I should be able to point to something and say, this is different. I may not have arrived, but praise God, I've left. I've met with Christ in genuine repentance and faith. And here's the impact. Not perfection again, but direction. All right, to the text. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Let's just stop with the first few words here. I am the true vine. This is the last of the I am statements, the sayings of Christ in the gospel. We went through them last time. You remember in John's gospel, there's seven of them. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And here, number seven, I am the true vine. Look in verse one, I am the true vine. Look in verse five, I am the vine. And my father, it says, is the vine dresser. So here we're in this passage. We have the vine and we have the vine dresser. The one who's looking after the vine. And in this analogy, Jesus is making it clear who the first two uh, personhoods are that he's referring to. I am the vine, and it's my Father who is the vine dresser. We don't need to complicate that. We can just accept that. There are two kinds of branches, though. There are fruit-bearing branches and non-fruit-bearing branches. Regarding the fruit-bearing branches, we find that they are pruned in order to produce more fruit. For the non-fruit-bearing branches, they're cut off and burnt. So we know the identity of the first two, the vine and the vine dresser. The vine is the Lord Jesus Christ. The vine dresser, the farmer, the one who's Looking after the vine is the father in this analogy. That much is settled. So who are the branches? Here's what we know. All the branches are attached to the vine. Some bear fruit and are pruned. Other branches do not bear fruit. They're cut off. They're dried and burned. Now, here's where context becomes so very, very helpful to us. You see, John chapter 15 is not a passage in isolation. It's not as if after chapter 14, they leave. In fact, the last verse of the chapter tells us they leave the upper room. They, they rise and go somewhere. And within a certain space of time, they end up in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus will pray what we read in John 17. And he'll, he'll be arrested, and the rest we know as we read on through the gospel. But at this point, we don't know exactly where they are. Are they on the way walking, or have they arrived at the, the garden? We're, we're not absolutely sure, but what we do know is this is not a passage in isolation. He's been talking with them about intimate things, and it's not as if in chapter 15 he goes off on a kind of space mission and speaks about things they've got no idea about. He's speaking in a context. And oftentimes when we're reading through our Bibles, we stop at chapter 14 at the end of it, take a coffee break and come to chapter 15 and think we're in a new subject altogether. But this is all one discourse. This is one intimate time with his disciples. And that really helps us when we come to this passage. Because from chapter 13, in fact, let's turn there, back to chapter 13, verse 1, we see so, so much From this passage in chapter 13 onwards, two types of disciples are clearly in this upper room. And the authenticity of their faith is being exposed. That's the big picture of what's happening here. Look at verse 1. This is John 13 verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the uttermost. Here we have the 11, the true disciples in the room. And yet there's one more. Look at verse 2. During supper... 
when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, and so it goes on. This tells us immediately that we have the 12. 11 of them are true disciples, and there's this one who is a false disciple, and he's about to be exposed. Jesus knew this was coming. He knew from the beginning who he was dealing with. All right, let's go back to chapter 15. Judas is at this very moment, having read chapter 13, he's on his way to negotiate Jesus' betrayal with the Jewish authorities. And the disciples have no idea. Jesus does. And not everything is going to make sense to them. Not now at least, but later it will. Jesus is is on a mission to tell them the most important things, and they're not going to get it right now. They haven't read the rest of the Gospel of John yet. And what is he doing? I would submit this to you. He's explaining the betrayal of Judas by means of this analogy. You see, Judas was attached to Jesus. He was one of the twelve. He'd have been around Jesus for over three years, doing what the others were doing, praying for the sick and seeing results. No one were coming to Judas and saying, look, uh, when you pray, nothing happens. Can I have Peter pray? No, there was no record of that. He'd been commissioned by Jesus, was attached to Jesus, at least in a religious sense, and was doing the stuff that the other disciples were doing. He was doing it religiously. He looked like the real deal. He was a trusted disciple. He was the the treasurer, for goodness sake. But there was no life and there was no fruit. Here's a clue when we can think about our own hearts in this, because this is not just a lecture. This is God speaking to us through his word. The more Judas learned of Jesus, the more he came to resent Jesus. Let not that be true of you. He learnt more and more as Jesus preached, as Jesus gave his parables, as Jesus explained to the twelve, he being one of them, what those parables meant. And the more he heard, the more frustrated he became because he was not on Judas's agenda. Judas wanted the overthrow of Rome. Judas was a zealot. He wanted to see Rome crushed by the Messiah. That was his expectation in the Messiah. And the more he was around Jesus, the more he was saying things like, we'll read later on, my kingdom is not, in, not of this world. Uh, I'm not here to overthrow Rome. My, my kingdom is kind of different from yours, Judas. Did not say those exact words, but that was what was going on, I'm sure, in Judas's heart. He wasn't on Judas' agenda. He signed up, and this was not what he signed up for. What's the condition of your heart? I hope that the more you know of Jesus, the more you love him. The more you hear his word, the more you say, I want to live my life according to it, rather than, I don't like that part. I'm going to cut that out of my Bible, or at least from my memory. See, Judas looked like the others. If we were to take a photograph of the 12 going back in time where we were allowed to do, we couldn't just look at the 12 and say, I can see Judas, look at those shady eyes. Look, there's something wrong. No, people didn't know. He was the trusted one. There was nothing about his appearance that made him look like the betrayer. He was still doing what the others did for a time, Actually, a long time, over three years. That's a lot of services, right? That's a lot of work. But he never was a true disciple. Go back in your Bible to John 6. We'll just stay in John for this. John 6, look at verse 70. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Jesus knew exactly who he was. 
Look at chapter 17. Honor your Bible, past 15 to 17, and Jesus prayed. One of the things he prayed, he prayed in verse 12, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. That's a theme you'll see repeated over and over in John's gospel. He keeps those given to him. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that he, that the scripture might be fulfilled. The obvious implication was he was not one given to him. But he kept the others. Judas was never the real deal. You see, some, let's go back to chapter 15, some use the John 15 passage to teach you you can lose your salvation. Look at Judas. But that's a misreading of the text. He was never a true disciple. And John plainly teaches what is described by theologians and those who study theology as the perseverance of the saints. Have you heard that phrase? Some call it the preservation of the saints. God causes those that he set his love on in eternity past to come to him and be preserved and never lost. Go back to John 6 for a moment. John 6. Let's see where this theme occurs. Verse 37. Looking a group of people in the eye who did not believe the verse before, verse 37 tells us that. In fact, let's read it. But I said to you that you've seen me and yet do not believe. And now he explains their unbelief. All that the Father gives me will come to me. What's the implication? You're not coming to me because the Father didn't give you to me. All that the Father, not some, not 80%, but all that the Father gives me will come to me. You have to come to Jesus to be saved. And all that the Father gives me will come. They'll come to me. And whoever comes to me, there's a 50-50 chance they'll never be cast out. Is that what your Bible says? I'll never cast them out. Look at verse 38. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And, okay, Jesus, I, I, would you agree with me before we read any further? Jesus always does the will of his Father. Amen. Can you imagine Jesus saying, and I, you know, I, I, you gave me three tasks and I did two of them, but I, I thought I didn't need to do the third one. No, he always did his Father's will. And Jesus spells out the fact that he's come to do the will of God, the Father, and he explains what that is. Let's, li- let's look at it. For I've come down from heaven, verse 38, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. All right, let's let our ears prick up. What's the will that Jesus will do of the Father? That I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but raise it. It refers to the entire group up on the last day. That's a reference to eternal life. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him, should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Strong language. Jesus will not fail in doing this will of the Father. Look in John chapter 10. Again, looking people in the eye and explaining their unbelief to them, highly controversial. I've met some pastors and say, oh, I, I, I don't preach certain things because it's highly controversial. Do you know you can't get past the first verse in your Bible without it being controversial? In the beginning, some say there wasn't a beginning. God, some people don't believe in God. Created heaven and earth. People don't, some people don't believe there is a heaven and an earth. You think, where are they? What? It's all imagination. Okay, well, that's controversial. Tell people the truth anyway. Jesus did. Look at verse 26. He's looking people in the eye and he's explaining their unbelief. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Oftentimes we read that the wrong way around. Well, they're not sheep, but if you believe, you can become a sheep. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus said. He says the reason you don't believe is because you're not my sheep. In contrast, look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And again, there's a 50-50 chance they're going to survive. No, and they will never perish. They, collectively, that means all of them. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 
My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. We're united in this. We're on a mission. I'm here to do the Father's will, and no one will snatch any of the sheep out of my hand. They will never perish. None of Christ's sheep will perish. They will never perish. None of the flock are snatched away. Turn to the right in your Bible to 1 John. I go there because, again, this is the same writer as we have in John's Gospel in the first epistle of John, chapter 2. 1 John, chapter 2. Look with me in verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Now he's speaking of those who are in opposition to the message of Christ. And yet they were part of the Christian group at some point. They looked the part, perhaps for a lengthy season. Again, I think of Judas, who looked the part. But he went out from us, right? He did not stay. He departed. He didn't stay with the eleven. He went out and betrayed Christ. Well, these antichrists are betraying Christ, even though they had been part of the ministry of the church. They'd worked alongside people like the Apostle John. Now they've gone and were preaching a different message. And what is John's commentary on it? Does he say, they were of us, but Christ lost them as true sheep? Oh, well. No, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. You see, there's a consistency of message, not only in the Gospel of John, but in the epistles and in fact the entire Bible. Christ does not lose any of his true sheep ever. He never has to report to home base and say, I'm sorry, Father. I've lost 17 in Peoria, Arizona this week. It's been a bad week. And let's not talk about Glendale. No, he's never had to do that. All that the Father gives me will come to me and I will raise it up on the last day, that entire group. So there were two types of branches in the upper room. Now it's becoming clear, right? There are the fruit bearers, the 11 disciples who are staying, who are abiding, who are hearing Jesus' words and continuing in those words. And there is the non-bearing fruit, that's Judas, who's not abiding and would be cut off. Turn, if you will. We've gone to a few passages. Let's go to another. Again, see the words of Jesus on this. It's so helpful. Matthew chapter 7. Familiar words again. But you'll see we're picking up a theme that is repeated in John chapter 15. Matthew chapter 7, it's kind of the tail end of the Sermon on the Mount. Look at verse 15. Matthew 7, 15. Again, Jesus' words, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, savage wolves. You realize this? When someone comes with a message that is not the true message of the Bible, proclaiming a different God and a different gospel. They may be outwardly looking like they're doing good in the community, but it's actually worse than a drug pusher going around the, the houses. With a drug pusher, you can simply die. With a false teacher, you'll die and go to hell. Verse 16, you'll recognize them By their fruits. Oh, consistency of message. You'll recognize them, the false prophets, the false teachers, by their fruits. Look at this. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? It's a rhetorical question, but we know the answer, right? The answer is no. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Let me suggest to you one of the fruits we should look for is not only a righteous life, but righteous doctrine. Doctrine matters. What you believe about Jesus matters. 
Jesus in John chapter 8 says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. That means that your sins will not be forgiven. Look at verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is, oh, isn't this sounding a lot like John 15? Yes. Is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Continuing reading, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. I know you. We're intimate, right? We've done a lot together. Lord, Lord. He says, not everyone who mouths the words, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but is the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, talking of the day of judgment, many will say to me, they'll be professors, they will profess something, but they didn't possess anything. And he will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name to speak forth your word and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Now look at verse 23, because I'm going to submit to you there's a consistency of message even in this. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I get encouragement from that. What? You're a strange bird. I do. You know why? Because I not only read what it says, I read what it doesn't say. He does not say, I knew you once, but you blew it. He said there was never a connection. There was never a relationship. I knew of you, but I never knew you. Not in a redemptive sense. Jesus never loses a true sheep. And he can say to the, to the goats, never knew you. Not, well, I, I knew you for three months. That, that little time when you, when, you, when you played church for a while, you, you, and, and then sadly we lost you. No, I never knew you. In contrast, we've already read it. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. Are the lights coming on? Are you seeing the consistency of the message? I hope so. Jesus is very clear. I love his clarity. Never knew you. Not, I knew you for a long time, but if you just kept going, you'd have got that. No, I never knew you. Never knew you. Now, when we understand that Jesus is explaining Judas' betrayal, we're in a position to read the passage. And this truth becomes very plain to see. Again, let's go to verse 1. I am, John chapter 15, the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Question, why does he describe himself as the true vine? Answer, because there was a false one. The fruitless and unfaithful vine. Theologians refer to something called the analogy of faith. The analogia fide. The idea here is the best interpreter of Scripture is the Scripture. Rather than running to someone else and a commentary, see what the Bible has to say on the subject. When you're reading a passage, say, uh, what does this mean? Does the Bible address that subject elsewhere? Does it use the same terms elsewhere? Go to that first before you go to someone else. The Bible is the best interpreter of the Bible. You start with clear passages on a subject. And once you grasp the truth, when you know that's the subject at hand, that's what it's talking about, you go to the more unclear passages. Have you noticed some passages are less easy to understand than others? Peter writes of that in 2 Peter. He says some things of the Apostle Paul are hard to understand. I think, thank God for you, Peter. It's not just me. But that's why we study, because we believe there is a consistency of message. And the more you study, the more clarity comes, right? So that you say, wow, that was unclear. Now through study of the Scripture, I I know it better. I can see what's being said here. Otherwise, there's no point to study. Oh, I've been studying for three years. Do you know the Bible better? I'm more confused than I've ever been in my life. No, something's wrong. You need to check out who you're learning from. If there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pew. Does the Bible identify 
the vine anywhere in Scripture? Absolutely, yes. Let's go back to a passage that was read earlier in our service, Isaiah 5. We're just going to go through this really quickly. Chapter 5 of Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Hmm. Instead of grapes, it yielded wild grapes. Useless inedible, sour berries. It was not succulent fruit. Clearly the vine is Israel. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you, what I will do to my vineyard, I will remove its hedge, hedge of protection, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. It will, I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, or, and briars and thorns shall grow up. Oh, it sounds like it's going to be trampled down. It's going to be cut off. It's not amongst those that are pruned. Words we find in John 15. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. There it is. And the men of Judah are his pleasant planting, and he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Go back to the book of Psalms, Psalm 80. Actually, if you're still in Isaiah... Go to chapter 27 for a moment. 27 verse 2. Let me read it. In that day, a pleasant vineyard. That's Isaiah 27 2. A pleasant vineyard. Sing of it. I am the Lord. Am its, I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it. I keep it night and day. I have no wrath. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle. I would march against them. I would burn them up together. Or let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. In days to come, Jacob shall take root. Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. He said, Psalm 80, if you're on the way there, we'll wait for you. Psalm 80, look with me. Verse 8. He brought a vine out of Egypt. Here he's speaking to the people of Israel whom he delivered out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it, it being the vine. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade and mighty cedars. The mighty cedars and its, with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move in the field will feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted, and for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. We're skipping over some verses in Jeremiah. Let me just re reference them. Jeremiah 2, 21, it says, Yet I've planted you a choice vine, speaking of Israel, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? Jeremiah 6, verse 9, Thus says the Lord of hosts, They shall glean thoroughly as a vine the remnant of Israel, like a grape gatherer, gatherer pass your hand again over its branches. Do you know Ezekiel 15 is all about Israel as the vine? Ezekiel 17, Ezekiel 19, Psalm 80, we've seen it. In Hosea 10, verse 1, we read, King James Version, Israel is an empty vine. And we know the record of history. Not all Israel recognized Messiah when he came. John had made that clear in chapter 1. You remember in verse 11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him. Who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
So in summary, these are the branches cut off like Judas. He's explaining Judas and his betrayal. And in contrast, I am the true vine. Jesus does this often, doesn't he? There were types in the Old Testament that foreshadowed, were a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm the true vine. I'm the true Israel. That just leaves us ready to look at the rest of the text. And we're going to read it and then simply stop and we'll pick it up next time. But now we've got a basis for looking at it because we've determined the four parties here. The vine, the one who looks after the vine, and the two types of branches. Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burn. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. That's what this passage is all about. The proof of being a true disciple. And that proof, ladies and gentlemen, is fruit. As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So ladies and gentlemen, how would you describe your relationship with the vine? Your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I respect him. I admire him. You know, you can have all that and not be a true disciple. A true disciple is one who looks to Jesus as the source of their life. For the true disciple, all I want to do is know him. I want to know him. I want to do his will. I want to follow him. I want to know what his word says. What he says goes. He's the Lord, and I'm his willing Doulos in Greek means slave. I'm a slave because I want to be. Only by living in living, vital union with Jesus can any of us bear spiritual fruit, pleasing to God. So ask yourself, is Jesus my life? Is the life of Jesus in the branch causes fruit to emerge. What do his words mean to you today? I trust there's no disconnect between Jesus and his words. Do you have a love affair with Jesus? Oh, yes, I love him. Do you have a love affair with his words? Oh, not so much. There's a disconnect. There shouldn't be one. Are you abiding in him? Are his words abiding in you? Is his word producing in your life? Ladies and gentlemen, we so need to know the vine. We need to know the Lord Jesus. And the way to do that is by what is described as repentance and faith. Repent means to change your mind. It means to change your course. It's a 180 degree turnaround. You're going one way, you repent, you turn around. You've been running from God, now you're turning to God. You've been doing your thing, now you're going to do his thing. You're now living to do what he says. Now, not in perfection, but in direction. If there's been no turn, there's been no repentance. Repent and believe the gospel. What's the gospel? It means good news. To have faith is to trust, to put your reliance on. If you were to hear that someone running into this a sanctuary today, say, the building's on fire. You wouldn't say, yes, amen, we believe that. There'd be a reaction. 
Some would panic, some would look for fire extinguishers, some would call people to come and help, some people would show leadership and so say, there's the exit, there's the exit, follow me. But we wouldn't do this, sit down and say, I've always believed that. Do you believe the message of salvation? Message that God sent his son into the world because we have been despicable rebels and in his love for us, he became a man to save us. He lived this righteous life after being born of a virgin, this beautiful, pleasing to God life. And then on the cross, he died in the place of sinners so that anyone who comes to him, he will in no way ever cast out. And we understand that at the cross, our sins were laid on him. His righteousness is given to us as a gift. And this one was raised from the dead and is now exalted at the head of the universe. This is not some little hobby Christians have that allows us to get through life in some way by thinking positively. This is the message of God for the world. God so loved this world, he gave his one and only son that anyone who believes in him, whoever does it, will in no way perish, be cut off, be burnt, but instead have eternal life. Have you come to him? Have you repented? Have you come to him on his terms? Say, Lord, I surrender. Uh, My life is yours. If you have not, do that this day. There is nothing more important than this. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your holy word, and we now ask that as we contemplate your words, you will work richly in our hearts and give us what we cannot produce by ourselves, true, genuine fruit. Fruit that will show a heart that has been made right with God that now beats to know you. Though we fail and though we sin, the regenerated, made alive heart in seeing our sin turns from it and says, I'm sorry, Lord. I repent. I confess my sin. I turn from it. Forgive me. Today, If you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. In Christ's name.